Um, and uh, shout out to all my relations, but also shout out to the land. Um, for uh, Libby did a, a really great land acknowledgement, and I won't go over that right now since we're uh, in the same location. But uh, shout out to the land for surviving all that it has survived and will continue to survive. Um, I'm grateful for that. Um, so this word intervention or intervening um, uh, to me means um, sort of changing or attempting to change the outcome of a process uh, like remembering or writing history in order to reduce harm, um, either harm that's happening uh, in the present or uh, even future harms and even past harms. Uh, so I think a lot of natives um, in recent years um, and recent I'm talking about since like, uh, I don't know, whenever we could, we could write in the English language, uh, natives got to a point where they, they kind of said, this is BS, I wanna tell it from, I wanna tell this story from my point of view. Uh, we know how to tell stories. Um, and what's more, we know how to tell our part of the story. Um, and these outcomes that uh, get perpetuated when silencing or removing uh, one from the past, um, these kinds of silences are perpetuated and result in things like uh, occurrences of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Um, it affects access to healthcare, to quality healthcare. Um, it also affects access to quality education and any services that might make your life as a person of color uh, livable um, if you are indigenous or like I said, a person of color marginalized in any of the intersections. Um, in order to reduce harm uh, or to change the outcome of the colonial project, uh, indigenous folks have been intervening uh, since before I uh, started this, doing this work uh, years ago. Uh, and we're doing this work to make this place uh, better and more livable. And um, so thinking about, this is Archives Month and we're talking about um, memory and history and, and a lot of memory and history of course is hold with, held within uh, the archival record, but a lot of it is not. And, and I think we're all coming to that understanding um, uh, pretty clearly. Uh, institutionalized memory, memory is privileged, as in um, colonized peoples or colonizing peoples have the privilege of remembering with a complete record of their historical activities. Uh, bias towards written records, um, you know, uh, sort of automatically count, cancels out many indigenous communities as they still rely mainly on oral conveyance of knowledge. Um, you know, I always joke that archives are there to keep the receipts, um, but natives don't keep receipts, right? We just sort of remember who owes us what, um, or at least your grandma does, right? Uh, but but we don't keep receipts. We we uh, we rely heavily on oral conveyance, like I was saying, of knowledge. And um, I like to think that I create my uh, my work orally as well as as in the written form. Um, but we have been largely left out of, of this history of the archival record. Um, and, you know, uh, one doesn't come to that realization uh, pretty lightly. Um, you know, if you're a person of color or marginalized in any way and you go into the archival record to conduct research on yourself of any kind, uh, I think there's a, a, a really harsh um, uh, there's a lot of harsh work that you have to, to uh, contend with. Uh, but because we're all so brilliant and those of us who are absent from the record or misinterpreted in the record, we are doing a uh, really important work that circumvents any um, conventional academic or scholarly frameworks for writing memory or remembering, uh, or um, excuse me, rememory. Um, and thereby I think I, I would argue that that makes it better and more complete. Um, and in fact, um, a very brilliant scholar by the name of Sadia Hartman, um, they urge us to, to sort of grapple with the scraps that are, that are in the archive, um, that are in the historic memory, the scraps that deal with people of color or colonized people. 
um, you know, if we come across those scraps within our, within our research, within the literature, uh, and we can use this to not only fill in the gaps of memory, but to, and more, possibly more important, to question why the gaps are there in the first place. Um, so, so there's one example of the amazing, amazing work that can be done with, with uh, you know, a, an archival practice, an archival framework that is inherently biased um, away from people of color and marginalized people and colonized peoples. Um, there's also uh, related, but but uh, also equally as amazing work is being done by uh, historians like Jennifer Dinetdell. Um, her work, Reclaiming Diné History, speaks directly to the divergence between Diné historical um, memory and non-Diné history, and as it's written in history books um, or in an academic setting. Uh, so her work is also very brilliant. Um, so not only are we rewriting our histories, we're using the gaps as spaces for further interrogation and visioning. Um, and, and that has come, that kind of really important work, that further in, in interrogation, the visioning, the speculation that's happening within indigenous scholarly circles, as well as um, activist circles uh, and creative circles um, is, is resulting in the likes of works done by uh, folks um, like Deborah Miranda, uh, who argues for a future uh, of her people that includes the Joyas who were the target of att attempted gendercide in Spanish colonial California. I think uh, Lauren's class has read this uh, recently. Um, but in, in that, uh, that excellent work, Extermination of the Joyas, um, done by Miranda, she speaks about this, this kind of path or journey that in her own research. So she's doing research for uh, a memoir she calls a tribal memoir. It's uh, it's called Bad Indians. It's very well written. Would highly recommend picking that up. Um, she writes that uh, you know she's learning about um, this third gender um, that she found mentioned in someone's uh, you know basically a footnote in an, in an archive. Um, and so she digs a little deeper and she finds a little more information about this a third gender itself, but also she finds out uh, basically the systematic um, termination that was going on um, during the colonial times in, in, uh, in California. Um, and I, I would say that I followed a very similar journey in my decoloni decolonizing the concept of gender uh, for me, I, um, uh, I don't identify, um, I don't use the binary, I don't identify as a, I'm a non-binary person, um, but in circles of uh, indigenous peoples, I, I identify as Dilba, which is the fourth gender um, in, in the Navajo gender system. I'm Navajo and I, um, because of what I learned, I've been able to use that gender system to sort of open up my understanding of what my role is in my community, which is um, also speaks to uh, the work of uh, Sean Wilson, who writes, uh, who wrote a, uh, an amazing work called Research is Ceremony. And this is very much an example of how when Indigenous peoples go into something like an archive to do research on themselves, they come out sort of learning this whole other uh, aspect of not only their work, but the, themselves as people. And that the accountability um, for indigenous research uh, is to the community. Um, and so in those ways, I'm trying to follow those, those kinds of footsteps in, in learning about my, my gender. And um, in that way, I, I have come across very excellent pieces and uh, in, in other works by, um, by indigenous anthropologists, namely Dr. Wesley Thomas, who, um, who talks about um, two-spirit Navajos and gendering Navajo bodies. Uh, and uh, he's, he's really been sort of the, the one scholar who's given me a lot of terminology. And so with this terminology and the language that I learned by uh, reading his dissertation, I've been able to, um, to compose further research questions that I can then take into my community to learn more about my, about my gender. Um, and uh, I was at, 
actually able to ask a couple of questions from two uh, two friends that um, who still live in in Nav uh, in the Navajo Nation, and we talked about gender and we talked about um, uh, colonial and religious sort of conceptions of what gender is, um, and we had a great conversation. And, and again, because I was learning about my own gender within the archival record, I was able to take questions to them and 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 really have a powerful conversation, a deep conversation about gender. Um, and the, the one really uh, amazing and salient point that I took away from that, from that um, conversation was that um, for, for a Navajo person who identifies as queer or two-spirit or any other, other terminology you wanna use, um, just by the nature of, of our gender system being, um, more than, than, than two genders, I'm able to fill roles that, um, that, you know, uh, that someone who, who adhered to only two genders might not be able to fill in their community. As an example, um, uh, I'm, I'm the fourth gender, which is Dilba in Navajo. And that basically means the, um, you're a biologically female bodied, but you, Fill roles that are male in the in your community. Uh, I hope I'm explaining that right, um, or it makes sense to you. And because of that, um, I have a skill set or a capacity to carry both sets of knowledge from both the male and the female in my community. Uh, and um, we were having this really great conversation, my two friends and I, and we were we were sort of um, laughing and joking that that we could be um, you know both your auntie and your uncle because we have both of those sets of, of skills and knowledge um, and and that is really what um, what I'm trying to learn more about and what I'm trying to sort of talk about in uh, these kinds of settings but also talk about that in in turn it around the gaze around to the archive and um, and look at how genders like Dilba or Joya's for Miranda are depicted within the archival record and why are certain uh, you know, ethnographic records uh, held in, in archives and uh, you know, is there room for also collecting and, and housing right next to ethnographic records, the records of, of indigenous peoples or the indigenous response to um, that ethnographic information being within an archive and um, and we know what happens to records that are held within an archive, those are then used to write history. So um, Libby was saying that the archive is not neutral and is definitely not. Um, that might've been in an earlier conversation we're having. Anyway, the, the, the archive is not neutral. And um, again, if you're going into, um, uh, in, into an archive and doing research on yourself, you sort of see these, uh, um, you, get a, you get a really up close and personal um, experience with, with the bias of the archive. Um, and anyway, I hope to use more of these uh, kinds of questions that I um, keep formulating through uh, after having conversations with, with other indigenous people, with other two-spirit people. Um, and, and really this is helping me to decolonize not only my framework and thinking around gender, but also um, visioning a, a future where the roles for someone like me who, who identifies as Delba can be um, you know, um, uh, contributing to, to my community. Uh, now and into the future, but also it helps me and all of us to really uh, question the archive um, and sort of interrogate the archive and look closely at it and turn it over and over and to, like Sadai Hartman says, to sort of consider why those gaps are there in the first place. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Seth. That was amazing.
Um, I always love having conversations about decolonizing gender with you. Joey, since I introduced uh, y'all in that order, would you feel like going next? Joey Miller, thank you so much. Uh, I like going second because first and best should go, or the best should go first and last. So I, I am forgettable for any anxiety or all that kind of stuff, but yeah. Um, yeah, anyway, Hesche Estango, Chauk Chifkidos, Eshawagi, Muskogi Minoma. Hi, my name is Joey. Uh, I'm of Beaver Clan of Muskogee Nation in Oklahoma. Um, and yeah, I just wanna say thank you for Libby and Lauren and everyone for uh, putting this together and for you all for showing up. This is way more people than I was expecting. So yeah, but it's awesome. Um, as Libby said during introductions, uh, my main research interest has been in Native American ethics. Um, in particular, I'm most interested in a, trying to understand pre-colonial ethical frameworks. Um, and so in doing that, I have to go into a lot of historical info and uh, you know try and find that. But the three ways that I've tried to understand pre-colonial uh, ethical structures or frameworks is by looking at particular concepts that are big in Native American ethics and how those concepts relate to other concepts, and so hence dissertation was on the concept of harmony and how it relates to a lot of other concepts like energy, reciprocity, gratitude, um, things like that, and the role that those concepts play in these larger frameworks. Um, I also have an interest in looking at the structure of Native American languages and seeing what those uh, structures can tell us about the ethical frameworks that are being used. Um, so just as an example, uh, you know, some native languages are verb-based languages. When you have a verb-based language, uh, understanding moral terms can take on a different meaning uh, when they're not referring to static properties or things like that. And so looking at kind of the ethical implications uh, for the way that language is structured, um, I'm hoping will help give insight into uh, pre-colonial structures. And then uh, my other uh, interest that I have is looking at contemporary moral issues that indigenous people are facing and then looking at how those are reflective of those pre-colonial moral frameworks and how they've been adapted to settler colonialism and uh, how these problems, you know, just take on new faces, but really a lot of the same problems keep popping up and settler colonialism hasn't gone away or isn't a thing of the past, but it's very much a pressing thing that's still going on. So in trying to do uh, this research, I came relatively late to doing native philosophy. I'd like to say my dissertation took eight years because I got in late to the game, um, but I didn't realize that native philosophy was a thing in Western uh, academia. Uh, it wasn't just something I, I was never exposed to and never had a class on it. It was never in any philosophy course. Um, but through doing my own research on like my family's history and my tribal history um, and things like that, I started to notice a lot of connections. And uh, thankfully, I have a very supportive advisor who told me just freaking go do this thing that you want to do. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. Um, but in doing that, uh, there were a lot of things that presented challenges, one of which was finding uh, information that wasn't whitewashed or wasn't filtered through uh, kind of colonial lens. So uh, in trying to learn the language that like my family had lost, uh, you know, a quick Google search, thankfully now it's easier, but uh, for a while there, what you would find is white people translating or putting emphasis on particular concepts or taking concepts out of uh, context. And so if you wanted to understand the role that harmony played, you can't just remove it from the moral framework from which it was developed and then plug it into a Western framework and go there, this is what we've been missing. 
you've removed all the relations and connections that that particular concept had to the land, to the people, to the history, and all those sorts of connections. And so it was kind of a challenge to find sources that weren't doing that, let alone um, one of the other things I like to do is look at, uh, in particular, my tribe Muscogee stories um, and see how they're structured and you know the ways and reasons in which they're told. And in doing that, a lot of stories uh, have been picked up by, you know, Benjamin Hawkins was a Bureau of Indian Affairs agent who learned Muscogee, but then translated all these things. And so if you're wanting to find a Muscogee story, oftentimes the first one that pops up is the version that's been translated by, you know, the federal agent. So that's not always easy. Um, and thankfully, I was able to, I've got three books that I would like to share because I feel like they were like foundational and helping me to understand. But one was, I don't know if you can see that, it's called The Sacred Path. Um, but it's written by Jean and Joyatpal Chaturi. And they are two Muscogee people who collected oral reports uh, from a bunch of elders and people in the community and then kind of relayed that information uh, to provide like a philosophical foundation in contrast to Western understandings. Um, one of the nice things about the book is that it goes really in depth on a lot of various things, but obviously there's a lot more research and you can expand on any one of these topics. Um, but even finding this short little book was, was a lifesaver for me. Um, one of the challenging parts, however, is in at least philosophical contexts, I assume other areas of academia are like this. If I'm writing a research paper and I have cited just one source, it's not gonna fly. Um, and part of the problem is this isn't just one source, this is an oral history. Um, and these people have collected these stories, these traditions, these customs, these beliefs from a community of people yet because it's collected in one book, it counts as one source. And so that often doesn't get to, it's not seen as a reliable uh, epistemic foundation. Uh, another book was Creek Indian Medicine Ways. This was partially written by David Lewis Jr. He was the last uh, full-blooded Muscogee medicine person before he passed away. But in it, it points, uh, out some traditional medicines, the plant names, what they were used for, uh, how it, how Muscogee medicine differs from Western medicine, uh, and having that context and hearing that kind of thing in his words has been really helpful. And then lastly, there's this book called New Fire by Ernest Goj. Um, and it's a bunch of traditional Muscogee stories, but what I like about it is on one page it's written in Muscogee language, and then the next it gets translated into English. And they elaborate in the story, or uh, uh, in the book, about kind of the challenges with the translations. And so one of the things is there's this phrase uh, in Muscogee, uh, oh my, what's his name? Uh, Fixico is the author. There's a book called That's What They Used to Say. Um, and it's kind of relaying the importance of oral history, but in Muscogee language, typically you would say that's what they used to say when you're conveying to someone that you do not have firsthand experience of something. Um, and part of the reason for doing that is uh, there's an emphasis on your ability to experience certain things and you knowing those things and then trusting what others have told you. So if I can see outside that it's raining, I might tell you that it's raining. But if someone I knew came and told me that it's raining, then I would have to say they said that it was raining. And that's supposed to convey like my direct experience with this kind of thing. Unfortunately, things like that about the language are not present in a lot of the whitewashed kinds of things. And so you get these kind of wonky translations that lose this kind of epistemic trust and uh, reliance on personal experience in the passing and conveying and understanding of knowledge. Um, so these three books have been like vitally important for me in my research, not only like professionally, but in understanding my family and my tribe um, and my kind of place in this whole dialogue. 
Um, and it's just kind of sad and frustrating that it's, these aren't easy things to find. So I grew up uh, not, I don't know how much to nerd out here. I'm gonna nerd out a little bit. Uh, my tribe growing up didn't have a, well, we did, but it wasn't acknowledged as a reservation in Oklahoma. And then it wasn't until a Supreme Court case in 2020 that the Supreme Court decided like, oh shit, yeah, we never dissolved that. So I guess there's still a reservation there. And so now in Muskogee, the boundaries uh, of the reservation have been restored, but I didn't grow up in Oklahoma. I didn't grow up with knowledge that there was a reservation or on the reservation. I grew up in Minnesota. And so all of my understanding of the tribe was done through my father, my grandma, my uncles, um, and that kind of stuff. Oh yeah, and Libby recommended this land podcast. So you shall check that out. It's about the Supreme Court case. Um, but yeah, my, my knowledge and my interactions with the tribe were through my grandma's history and through her teachings and our discussions there. And one of the things was she was, you know, placed in a boarding school at a very young age, and she had kind of the language beaten out of her and stolen from her. So when I was little, the only thing that she remembered how to say was Wagus in Muskogee, and that just meant stop or no more. And so growing up, that was the only bit of language that she knew. Uh, after she got released from the boarding school, back to my great grandmother, my great grandmother didn't speak English. And so my grandma and my great grandma could no longer communicate verbally because one was not speaking English and English was the only language the other one had left. So it took some time in negotiating and you can imagine the hardships of not being able to communicate with your family. Um, but as a result, it's been a struggle for you know, me and my sisters and my dad to try and understand the language, the political structures, the history, things like that. And not being in Oklahoma, there aren't a lot of libraries or archival uh, sources that have information about Muskogees. And then same thing, in the, I've lived in Seattle, I've lived in Virginia and North Carolina. Um, it's a lot of time in Wisconsin and Southern California. Those places, though, don't have those kinds of uh, books in the library. They don't have archives. And I feel real bad about calling my tribe every you know, couple of days and being like, hey, I need this information. Like, there's only so much of you could do that without being an asshole. A-hole, sorry. Um, but yeah. So it's been kind of a struggle to not only access, but figuring out how to access that kind of information. Um, and thankfully I've, you know, I've come into a community of you lovely people that have helped me to find better resources, to feel more connected. Um, and then thankfully my try, you know, contacting them, going on websites, getting book recommendations, um, things like that have been a lifesaver, but yeah. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop there. So Mado, thank you. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you, Joey, for sharing. I assume that it's my turn now. <laughs> Um, I'm going to begin with a land acknowledgement. I am in so-called Washington, D.C., uh, the seat of colonial power, if you will. Um, this is the ancestral and contemporarily occupied territory of the Piscataway and Anacostia people. Um, they are not federally recognized tribes in this area and fight every day for recognition. Um, there's also a very vibrant uh, urban native community here in DC uh, that I'd also like to acknowledge. And I'd also like to acknowledge that since we're on Zoom, oftentimes the landedness of digital communication is, you know, kind of left out of the acknowledgement and the picture. Um, and there's so much land that goes into making this kind of communication possible. The electrical grids, the, the lithium extraction um, worldwide, that's uh, land. And there are 
um, human and non-human relatives that are affected by that displacement um, all over the world. But in the United States context, much of that um, extraction and land that is on or adjacent to um, Indian reservations. So that's land too that I think we should acknowledge in these spaces. Um, Miriam, no tong shawi nawi let mais nariaka, no on atah piquim kawish, no piwi no yo pok and neshma chokyap on ganeshkin, no on shushavit ipit, alkan piscatawayanga and acostinga. Um, I introduced myself in my ancestral language. Uh, my name is Shelby Nawi Let Meisner. Um, I am Luceno and Cupeno, which are indigenous communities in Southern California, right outside of San Diego. Um, I am an assistant professor of philosophy at Georgetown University. Um, and it's like, it's my third year here. I've been here for this, no, it's my second year here going on my third and it feels like I just got here. It, you know, I got here, then there's a pandemic and suddenly, um, yeah, it is, what even is time exactly? <laughs> um, yes, so um, I come to Georgetown my dissertation is on indigenous language revitalization. I really had every single intention, I swear, to end up back in California, to end up at home. But for those of you who are familiar with the academic job market, you kind of just go where you end up. You don't have a whole lot of control over that. Um, so I come to Georgetown, but still having every intention of returning home to work on language reclamation. Um, it's been my responsibility in the past to be the K through 12 language instructor. Um, I've worked on dictionaries for my communities, like language is my, is my shit. That's what I wanted to do. That's why I came to Georgetown because I thought that there would be all of these opportunities to go home and do that work. But then the pandemic hits and suddenly, um, one of the things that feels extremely unsafe is to go to a reservation, sit at a table of multi-generational language learners, learning how to make the Luceno X sound, which is probably one of the more dangerous uh, with respect to COVID sounds you could probably make. Um, so a lot of my language plans um, ended up being kind of put on hold. Um, we, all over the language revitalization community, um, in indigenous spaces, the pandemic started to become a enormous um, space of loss for us because so many of our speakers are elders. So much of our language transmission, it must come from elders to youth, elders to youth. That's how so much of this language and knowledge transfer happens. And that becomes more and more impossible as gathering is not possible and more and more impossible as our loved ones are being lost to the pandemic. Um, so we'll, we will see language revitalization as something that is being really deeply affected by, um, by the pandemic. Um, so that being said, I'm here in Georgetown, can't go anywhere, can't go home. Um, I end up kind of losing a little bit of focus and not necessarily having uh, the opportunities to work on the language that I wanted. Um, and I ended up weirdly kind of pivoting into doing work in critical social work um, with tribal child welfare and I started working as a, as a tribal cultural consultant for social work programs. And that ended up being a surprisingly rich space for engaging with archives because one of the most, um, one of the most important parts of indigenizing and decolonizing social work and critical social work is to infuse indigenous feminist conceptions of family and kinship into that work. Um, we can talk about that more later if you're interested, but um, it's really important to center indigenous conceptions of families in that sort of work. And that requires language research, that requires um, engaging in archives, that requires sometimes putting up a fight to universities and libraries that are holding our ancestors or holding our ancestors' voices in ways that make it very difficult to access. Um, so that is kind of like my trajectory is when I was in graduate school, my language was my life. I lost a little bit of focus and now I found an, uh, an interesting for the time being way of being connected to it. And that's kind of the professional trajectory. Like that's what somebody would see if you were my colleague. Um, but there's also like a, a separate way of tracking my engagement with archive and language that doesn't show up on my CV and doesn't show up in the professional tracking. And that's that I have a long tradition in my family of people working to save our language. Um, my family is from Southern California and colonization in California is a, is a very, very interesting and kind of 
nuanced situation where we have had colonization from the Spanish, the English, Americans, Russians, lots of folks came through uh, California and just, I mean, wrought despair on our communities. Um, and one of the things, you know, we have Spanish colonization, we have the gold rush, we have all of these really awful moments of genocide in our in our communities. But another very strange thing that happened in California in around the 1930s, 40s, 50s is this intense period of salvage ethnography, which is where linguists, anthropologists, ethnographers came to California, descended on Southern California, and um, and recorded lots of our languages, but also, you know, dug up our bones and stole them and put them away in their universities, um, really for their own academic fame and fortune. There was no community-based participatory research back then. There were no indigenous methods. Sean Wilson's book was not uh, was not circulating at the time. So there was some very, very extractive and violent eth uh, ethnography, ethnographic work done at the time. And California Indians, because they're so, uh, close in proximity to the UC systems, which is one of the number one perpetrators alongside uh, the Smithsonian uh, of this particular practice. Um, because we were in such close proximity to them, there's so many incidences of our ancestors having to make these really complicated decisions to speak with as informants, these, uh, you know, vulture-esque um, anthropologists and linguists. And I spend a lot of my time thinking about my ancestors who made those decisions to converse with these folks. Um, and I wanted to kind of share with you a little bit of the trajectory, the non-professional trajectory of my relationship with language and archives by showing you a poem that's a little embarrassing that I wrote at the beginning of graduate school. I'm going to put the PDF in the chat. I'm so sorry that it is not a searchable PDF. Um, I kind of just stole it from the internet, but I um, I will post this in here and then I will send you an accessible version to Libby and um, at the end of the at the end of the talk. So here it is. It's coming in to you here and then I'm going to read it on my side. Again, forgive me, it's just the very beginning of grad school. <laughs> But there's a story I want to be able to tell you, and I already wrote it in the poem, so I'm going to read you this poem. <clears throat> also, I was at the Capitol protesting all day uh, for Indigenous Peoples Day, so my voice is almost gone. So I don't normally sound this like raspy and sultry. Normally, I have that California, uh, that very California um, uh, high pitch. Sorry, I see there's an issue with image. I will circulate this afterward, I promise. Okay, I will read this. <clears throat> I have a fortunate set of recordings from the late 60s of my great, great, great Auntie Gertrude Chore speaking and singing in Luceno, Atajam Pumtela, Cham Tela, to a white linguist. In the recordings, my great, great grandma Isabel chimes in once in a while. I imagine the white linguist at his tape recorder playing and pausing my family from existence. His kind flocked to Southern California to pick the bones of our language. Two Indian sisters and a rude white linguist are in the house. Quila wachak, quila wachak, kinga, kinga, kinga. The black oak trees are standing, the black oak trees are standing in the house, house, house. Isabel mentions how sad she is that she doesn't speak as much of the language as her sister, but she tries her best to converse anyway, often code switching from English to Spanish to Indian to Spanish to English. Her code switching is met with her sister's derision, but they both laugh and are both angry. There's no real Indian word for cat. We use the word gato. Spanish, English, and Indian are in the house. Quila, wachak, quila, wachak. Kinga, kinga, kiga. The black oak trees are standing. The black oak trees are standing in the house, house, house. I listen to the whole recording, 45 precious minutes every week, every few weeks as I've been taking my language classes. Each time I listen, I catch more and more words and I began to know my great, great grandma who I never met and her scratchy deep voice, the now predictable mishmash of her languages. I realize when I hear Luiseno, it isn't really just one language. It's several languages adapted 
ever-changing, resting now temporarily. It's the island languages borrowed from our well-traveled cousins. It's the Nawa exchanged up and down the coast. It's Cupeño to the south, Cahuilla to the east, and Bribri all the way in Costa Rica. Sometimes when I listen to the recording, I feel like I'm sitting in how I imagine that room, the three of us, plus one annoying white linguist. But really, a pair of aging giddy sisters and me swimming in the sounds of the language, hearing in it the land called California and her people and their stories. Gertrude, Isabel, and Shelby are in the house. Quila wachak, quila wachak, kinga, kinga, kinga. The black oak trees are standing, the black oak trees are standing in the house, house, house. I can tell more and more every time I hear them that the language is really more like a mockingbird of Southern California mockingbirds. It mimics the black oak acorn trees rustling in the hot mountain wind, the hummingbirds flitting, the car zooming down Mount Palomar. It's the trickle of the river, the patter of forced marching from Warner Springs, families laughing on porches on the reservations. It's children splashing around in the lake and telling stories about how Monkey Island got its name. It's Lake Henshaw drying up, it's earthquakes and dams and deadly wildfires. It's Spanish reluctantly, English too. It's woven of many mother and stepmother tongues and all three of us are fluent. Quila wachak, quila wachak, kinga, kinga, kinga. The black oak trees are standing, the black oak trees are standing in the house, house, house. So that's my poem that I wrote at the beginning of um, grad school. And it's the part of the story that I wanted to make sure to share, make sure to share with you is that when I was young, my family found a, a recording, a copy of some um, language conversations and songs that from my ancestors who had been talking to this linguist. Um, and I've had these since I was young and I've listened to them hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times at this point. I memorized it, those sounds are imprinted in my head. And so much of how I know my own language is from trying to recreate the sounds of those songs and sentences. Um, and like I had told you in the professional trajectory of my relationship with language and archives, I kind of, I moved to DC and lost a little bit of that connection to that language, but I can still listen to those recordings. And there are several parts of the recordings where my ancestors say to the white linguist, you know, keep this, keep these recordings, keep this knowledge. Soon we won't be around anymore and we need to make sure that somebody has this. There's another part of the recording where you can tell that Gertrude is alone and has taken the recording device and is speaking into the recording device and says, Mr. What's his face isn't here right now, so I'm going to tell you about this. And so she's she's talking to me, she's talking to my generation, she's talking to the people who will eventually someday come into the archive and find these stories and songs that she's left as safekeeping in this colonial archive. Um, and yes, I could listen to that and I knew they were talking to me, but as I was working here in Georgetown, I guess grandma intervention. <laughs> as I was working here in Georgetown, I started kind of losing the connection until literally a couple weeks ago, right as I started meeting Lauren and Sos and Libby, I got a call from a guy at UC Berkeley who works in the archives, the language archives. And I spent a lot of time in my professional career talking shit about UC Berkeley's language archives. Like it's literally one of my go-to publication ideas is let's look at what Berkeley did this week that's really messed up. Um, so I figure, I figure out who's calling me and I find, I find out that this guy has, has found the box of the white linguist his, all of his corpus, all of his un, unfiled archive, all of his secret notes, all of his, his pictures. And he, this linguist found out from a friend of a friend of a friend who I was and that this was my family that was in the picture and blessed this linguist's heart. He found me, read my work, which is probably really scary for him as, a, as an archivist, and then called me and told me that he has all of these pictures that he wants to send me. And beautifully, he sent me a picture I had never seen, my grandfather had never seen, no one in my entire family had ever seen, this beautiful picture of Gertrude Chore, my great, great, great auntie, and Isabel, my great, great grandmother, with the white linguist as they're recording, as they're recording the, um, 
the stories and songs I've been listening to my almost entire life. And it's such a beautiful story and it's such a beautiful in intervention back into my life that my ancestors are continuing to say, hey, we put this in safekeeping for you. You have to come back. <laughs> you have to come back and get it from here. Reclaim this for, for you, for your generation and for your people. Thanks for listening to my story. <laughs> Oh, and I'll show you the picture. I'll put it in the, I'll put it in the chat. Thank you all so much, Shelby. Thank you so much for sharing that story. I feel like that is um, that is a few archivist dream to be able to like send stuff back to be like, we shouldn't have this stuff. Let's let's send this back. That is an amazing story. And I'm so glad that you get to steward this materials now. Um, Lauren, I know that we have we have worked on some questions, but I also want to be able to open it up for folks to ask some questions. Um, interact. How would you like to do it? I want to. Oh no. Okay, I was going to see if I could talk. No, no, that's not going to work. Okay, so if I, I will go into a different room. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Libby. Sorry about that. The sound uh, is reverberating back on us. Um, but yes, we have we have some questions, and the students um, back in the other room also have some questions. And unfortunately, I cannot be in the same room because the sound reverberates. But um, I would love to ask. I mean, I have so many questions, and so I don't want to hog the time and I know that others may have questions and so please put them in the chat. Um, but the one that I was most excited to ask, um, and this immediately relates to um, Shelby's wonderful forthcoming article that my students read um, for today. Um, and we had a really rich conversation about this. Actually, we spent much of the last hour, the hour and a half before the session started debating what we think reclamation means um, and what reclamation would look like. Is it um, an ethic? Is it a politics? Um, we're curious about the temporality of reclamation. Is it something that there can be, like we can talk about before this was reclaimed or after, or is reclamation an ongoing process? Um, and is reclamation ever complete? Um, and we'd love to hear, so, so it was interesting, students found that term um, really resonant, certainly for thinking about decolonizing archives, but they also found it really relevant um, I had one student thinking about um, reclamation and the body um, and thinking about reclaiming her experiences and her own body. So we'd love to hear more about reclamation. I can say a little bit about the history of the term reclamation, mostly in my work, and I think in a lot of uh, indigenous language work, folks tend to use the term reclamation as an alternative to revitalization. One of the things about the term revitalization, and this comes from uh, Wes Leonard, who's a fantastic Miami linguist and philosopher of language. Um, I'll call him that, he doesn't call himself that. Uh, he uh, very much works against these terminality narratives or death narratives about language. He says that there is no such thing as a language that can die as long as the people who can speak it are, or the people who can eventually learn to, to take it back or to learn to speak it again, um, exist, they can always bring back a language. So it's never, um, it's never dead. So he, he speaks against uh, dead languages, dying languages, some of these like manufactured crisis ways of talking about language that are very much connected to this white saviorism of um, extracting knowledge from indigenous communities. So Wes Leonard is the one who introduces the term reclamation. He says, we're not revitalizing our languages because our languages don't need vitality because our languages cannot die. We are reclaiming our languages because they are stolen. And this has particular resonance in a place like California where we have been subject to so much salvage ethnography, um, where universities have literally taken my ancestors' voices and put them on the shelf. Um, reclaiming is going into those spaces and taking them back. 
There are other situations where that may not be as resonant, where there's communities who have uh, a lot of their language and cultural resources kind of at their fingertips because they, um, you know, they had a more established way of doing so. Um, those maybe reclamation doesn't resonate with those communities as much, but I think for California Indians, we use the term reclamation to mean a taking back of what was stolen from us. And I think it is a politics in the sense that it, I don't know that it can ever be completed until the settler colonial nation state no longer exists, which, you know, I'm a hopeful dreamer of decolonial futures. I think that is possible. And um, so as long, as long as the land is not in our control, the re re reclamation and rematriation project is never over. Thank you, that was such a rich answer. Um, I would love to, um, I mean, I'd love to hear more um, from our other speakers about reclamation, but actually I'm going to more pointedly tie this in as a question for Joey. Um, so, um, and I just, I appreciated all three of your presentations so much. It's weird to talk to you with this mask on, but I've been like smiling and emoting a whole lot. So um, just thank you for all of the insights that you've shared. Um, but Joey, um, relating to Shelby's work, um, which I know you're also teaching in your class, um, how is language related? So, so I know in your class, you're thinking a lot about land um, and connections to land. And I'd love to hear, um, a bit about the assignment, like you're giving a really, really interesting assignment to your students, which I've heard a little bit about. So maybe you can share that a bit, but I, I'd love to hear about how you understand language in connection to land and how we might describe the harms of settler colonialism. I mean, honestly, I think Shelby's poem just did this more powerfully than any way I can put it, but, but how settler, the harms of settler colonialism um, include the disconnection of language from the land. Um, and if you might speak to us more about, about how land shows up in your class. I can try. Um, so yeah, one of the things, I mean, my assignment was very vague, um, but I wanted each of the students to think about their relationship to the land and how it's informed, you know, their habits, their practices, their language structure, the way they think about the world, the beliefs they've developed, um, all those kinds of things. And I think one thing, one, uh, issue with settler colonialism is it kind of works to distance people from their relationship to the land. So it's not like, you know, as people, our relationship to the land has gone away or anything like that, but it's just not a focal point in certain, uh, you know, in Western frameworks. And so when you lose, like contrasting with indigenous or native American frameworks, um, I mean, you can look at the kinds of things that have moral standing, the language that's used to describe those. So um, this is a, I'm not sure this is, a, I'm, not, I'm gonna hope this makes sense. Um, but in native languages, sometimes, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they're verb based. And so if you see something like a stream or a mountain or something, the literal translation into English would be that being is mountainy or that's, that body of water is streaming or laking. Um, and understanding languages like that gives a certain kind of moral capacity or a moral standing to those entities that they don't seem to have in Western ethical systems. Um, and I think that kind of standing for other than human or, uh, creatures and ecosystems and things like that, uh, you can start to see that that further contributes to them distancing uh, people from their relationship to their surroundings, whether it be land or animals, um, and seeing that, you know, humans are something outside of the natural world or nature or above it or are places to control and dominate uh, instead of learning to live with and reciprocate and show gratitude. Um, and all these kinds of practices start to become diminished or hard to uh, reconcile or uh, use a word we were just talking about reclaim um, in other contexts. And so, yeah, in, in that particular assignment for class, I wanted to try and get students to think about their relationship to the land and force them to realize this is something you have. It's just not something that you probably thought often enough because the paradigm that we're in the Western framework doesn't encourage it, um, acknowledge it, and the kind of relationship that it establishes or promotes is one of domination and control. 
uh, instead of learning to adapt and live with and uh, reciprocate with those kinds of entities. Thank you, Joey. Um, and it'll be really interesting to hear more. So I, I'm really lucky to have four students in um, both Joey's class and my class. So about half of my senior seminar is also um, taking Joey's Native American philosophy class. And so um, Shelby's research into um, the colonial shaping of archives and the possibility of reclamation has been so rich for us um, at that intersection. Um, I have lots more questions, but uh, if any other folks have questions, I I'll let you know um, at 7.15, I will stop the recording um, and folks may feel more comfortable asking questions in that way. Um, uh, but I'd love to ask one of the questions that we were working on in advance um, for Shepard. Um, so, so my students um, for today in senior seminar um, read Shelby's fantastic forthcoming essay um, and also the extermination of the Hoyas, um, which Sos mentioned in their remarks, um, and which is a piece that I'm so grateful to Sos for introducing me to. Um, this piece has taught me so much about um, violence in the archives, so much about the history of biopower, um, just such a productive essay. Um, and, and, and I've really been taken with Miranda's claim, which we were talking about quite a bit in class today. Um, Miranda's claim, which could be controversial, um, that California Two-Spirit people are the rightful descendants of the Hoyas. Um, and we were thinking about that in terms of what does it mean to claim oneself as a rightful descendant? Um, does that obscure the, hist the historical difference of the experience of third gender people, third gender, third gender indigenous people uh, pre-contact or pre-colonialization? Um, what, what do you think Miranda means by invoking that generational connection? Um, some of my students were really inspired by that move and I'd love to hear um, more of your thoughts. Yeah, that's a great question, Lauren, thank you. Um, and I, I think the the answer, the question is, um, you know, right below the surface is a lot of nuance. And the answer also has a lot of nuance, I think. And I and it to claim to claim community, um, I feel like you can only do so rightfully or morally if that community claims you back. Um, and I I don't know much about um, the uh, where this community is now in in California and, and what they're doing, um, but I know that they, uh, just like me, want to be recognized as a part of their community. And um, and I think what what Miranda is getting at is that kind of what Joey was saying as well about, or I'm sorry, um, Shelby was saying about languages. They don't actually die. Um, the the Joyas were, uh, yes, targeted for gender side um, within uh, within that that time period, but they didn't. Um, they weren't exterminated, um, and I and I think in a lot of ways, uh, you know, they're just kind of um, reclaiming their their stake or their uh, their role in their community and and. Um, and when I read that by Miranda, I, I took that as kind of a, a call to action as well from that community to, to uh, step up and take their place in the community. And, um, but I don't, Shelby, you might have a, a little bit more context to give um, on, in this, on this community than I can. All I can say is that, um... I think there's a lot of complicated, uh, there's a lot of complicated umbrellaing that happens when we talk about language, Western colonial language to describe um, indigenous conceptions of kinship and family. Um, even the term two spirit as we know is a relatively recent, recent, I feel like it's recent because it's as old as I am, but I'm apparently getting old too. So <laughs> it's about a 30 year old term. Um, and, uh, it was it was invented as a form of reclamation of saying, look, we need to make this term because our uh, gender and sexuality expressions that are you know, our ancestral responsibilities are not being captured in many ways by some of these other umbrella terms. 
Um, so I think that one of the things that's really interesting about the term two spirit and one of the umbrella roles that it can play is exactly like so said, where it invokes this understanding of, of ancestry, of moral ancestry, of a different conception of genealogical ancestry that's not a literal heteropatriarchal nuclear type of understanding of family and descendants. Um, it is an expanded indigenized decolonized understanding of family and what it means to pass down the responsibilities that we associate with gender and indigenous communities. That was so perfectly said. Thank you, Shelby. Um, and I, I think, um, this can actually lead into, um, oh, and Devanya writes in the chat, yeah, like the notion that communities that we claim are ours if we are also claimed by them, right? That the inner relationship of community is crucial. Um, and one thing that I was thinking about um, with that question and with the ancestral claim and thinking about like how that claim could be made in a way that was not appropriative or violent. Um, so this relates to another of my questions for Shepard. Um, so, um, thinking about how can the archives um, offer a site for decolonizing gender um, when the archives have historically, especially in the history of residential schools um, and other educational spaces, um, been so harmful. Um, so thinking about, um, you know, how have you found ways um, to essentially use the institution against itself? Um, and another way to put this is, you know, I think uh, we spent a lot of time talking today um, in senior seminar about what Shelby really, I think, perfectly sets up as a simulated dilemma. Um, in whose interest is it to um, suggest that we can only either appropriate or abstain? Um, but, but I'd love to hear um, more of your thinking about how you find resources for decolonizing gender in the archives. And I will, after your answer to this, I will stop recording so folks may feel more comfortable. Thanks, Lauren. Um... Uh, the short answer is yes, the, the archive does provide a space or a, or a place for um, decolonizing notions of gender, frameworks of gender, especially in terms of the, the binary system that has been imposed on indigenous, oh, any, any people actually, uh, not just indigenous people. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's a trap. It's, it's fake and it's held up by, by a friend of mine says it's held up by twigs. Um, and, and I really like that, that there's, there's a, there's a whole, um, there's a whole systematic support for, for a binary gender system. And that goes back in, even into the archive. And so we see that in, um, how, uh, for example, the joyas were spoken of in, in, um, <laughs> True, Shelby. Um, uh, we see how how the violence is is, an, is enacted when um, you know ethnographers or anthropologists or the clergy um, speak of of uh, third gender people uh, in disparaging ways and derogatory ways. So we see how um, how that is depicted within the archive. But I also um, you know just relying or leaning on the work of uh, Folks like Jennifer Danettdale, um, uh, Sadia Hartman, where they're sort of using um, that problematic uh, depiction or or record of of a people or a community of people, um, and and really turning that and and asking more questions about well, why have they been depicted that way? Why are they missing in every other way other than to other them uh, to speak about their gender in, in really awful ways? and to um, use that as, as uh, evidence to, um, to attempt to, to uh, exterminate them. So I, I think, yes, there are lots of ways to, to decolonize your thinking around gender and the concepts of gender, but really I think it's, it's looking at also how those, that language, that, that attitude, those records are used to make policy um, around gender as well. So, um, Again, there, there's so many ways that you can you can look back into the archival record, look at those scraps that I mentioned before, and um, really use those as as ways to formulate further inter further inquiry. Um, and that to me has been the most powerful sort of process um, that I've gone through that um, uh, that's similar to what 
to what Miranda talks about in her in her article, Extermination of the Joyas, where you know I'm in the archive learning about um, you know an event in my people's history, um, and you know following it into present times. Um, that's why you know we have uh, uh, queer and um, I guess queer communities going underground, uh, queer indigenous communities being underground for for a long time, and and again they didn't die. They they weren't uh, the extermination wasn't su successful. These people still lived, and um, just like languages don't die, the the, the joyas didn't die. But um, but again, just just having access to that kind of information, that kind of data within the archive helped me to formulate again those further questions that I wanted to go to take back into my community um, in a respectful way and in a way that that has accountability to my community. I'm not just doing this work in a vacuum. Um, I'm doing it to to help them as well as much as I can. Um, and that also, I, I feel like that also, um, if I'm turning the gaze back onto the archive, that helps me decolonize notions of the archive and what that means to find myself in, in that way in an archive recorded by, um, you know, a, a white linguist or a white ethnographer. I hope that answers the question. And that is such a perfect way to end the recording. Thank you. That was like a perfect way to end the recording. So I'm going to end the recording now. And others who may feel more comfortable asking questions not on the recording, run wild. <laughs>